guys can have a seat. As we wait, amen? Amen. amen. What do we do when we wait? We do serve. The Lord's work, right? We serve. We draw closer to the Lord. We come to church. We do those things as we wait on our Lord. We've been in, me, Stacey, and Rommel's been in church since Monday. Amen. We're still going. Yeah. Yeah. Up. yeah, we went to a conference. We just got back this afternoon. Oh, good. We're still rolling. Yeah, it's went great. Yeah. Uh, picked up some things I'll probably share with our church down the road. Some good stuff. Uh, took some notes, and I'll, I'll probably pass that on to our congregation. But it was just a good time. Uh, good time in the Lord. Right? Amen. Uh, Amen. Like most of you, I'm tired today, but the Lord's going to see me through, and I'm going to sleep real well tonight. Amen? Amen. So we're, we talked about, we had uh, testimony Wednesday last week, but before that, since it's a love month, it's uh, Valentine's month, we, we talked about God's love, and we talked about two weeks ago that the scripture offers us an understanding uh, of the God's love and the character and the value of it based on the nature and the actions of God. We we shared John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, right? That, that none of us should perish. And we know that Christ's existence is, 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 is here to be an extension, or he came to be an extension of the Father's love for us. That was the purpose of his coming. The, the cross is a symbol of death, but it's also a symbol of love. When you see that cross, every time I walk in our church and I see that cross, <laughs> it reminds me of God's love for me. Because he loved me enough to pay the price. Everything that Christ did, everything that he said, his whole sole purpose for coming to this earth was to die for me and you. Amen. So that we don't have to spend eternity separated from the Father. That's love, right? 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Amen. So we know love is an action word, and we know that God communicated that love for us by sending his son so that we might, just might, man, just with a hope that some will grasp it and get a hold of it, just with a hope that that old dopey Norman Chandler might come into a saving relationship with the Lord Jesus Amen. Christ, that he just might. That you just might. There's plenty out there that need to just might. Right? Amen. And there's going to be some that don't. Love's an action word. And God reveals his love to mankind. He reveals it in many ways. He reveals his love. But in the Old Testament, God's love was shown in how he dealt with the nation of Israel. If you look at Deuteronomy 7, 7 and 8. The Lord did not send his... Uh, Affection on you and chose you because you were more numerous than the other peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But it was because the Lord loved you and kept the oath he swore to your ancestors that he brought you out of, uh, brought you out with his mighty hand and redeemed you from the land of slavery, from the power of Pharaoh, the king of Egypt. And every time they fell away, you can read over and over in the Old Testament how Israel fell away. And every time in his great love, he received them back. His great love still awaits every sinner to repent. Every prodigal that's out there in the pig pen, he, he's there with his great love waiting for you to return. Amen, Lord. That, that's what God's love is, right? His great love is still there. Still waiting for those who have fallen away, who have turned away, who haven't even accepted it yet to come. He's still waiting. Yes, he's going to punish you. Yes, he's going to send you to hell if you refuse to acknowledge what his son Jesus has done in Christ. But if you do, he's right there with that great love waiting to extend it to you. Hallelujah. Every time you fail, every time you sin, every time that sin pulls you away from the Lord, as you confess it and make it right, he's right there with that great love with those arms Amen. open wide. Amen. And as we've talked about beginning of the year, we talked about obedience, which brought us into disobedience, which brought us into the... Uh, the example of Jonah this year so far, and we're going to get into what disobedience can cause many to do, and that's to fall away. We'd like to say backslide, right? Uh, we're going to talk about that this Sunday, probably next Sunday too. But even in that condition, whew, God's right there, man. Just come back. Amen. That's his great love. His great love never fails us. When we fail us, his love never fails us. 
When we're unfaithful, he's still faithful. Thank you, Lord. Man, that's love, right? And in the New Testament, his love is shown in sending his son to die. In Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So in his great love, God found a way to bring us into right standing with him. And there was only one way that could happen. And that's through the precious blood of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way that we can be reconciled to God is through the blood of Jesus Christ. But in his great love, he had his son shed that blood. In his great love, right? That we might, just might, live through him. See, might, it's our choice to make. God's so loving that he gives us a choice. You know, some of us ain't going to make the right decision at times, right? But that we might. That we might choose him. He doesn't make us choose him against our will. He simply offers us a way to experience his love. And that way is through his son, Jesus Christ. And to think there are some who have rejected God's love. He loved us not expecting anything in return, right? God has nothing to gain by coming to this earth to save mankind. He did it all for us. That we might. That we just might say, you know what? That's like I did 18 and a half years ago. I think I'm going to give God a chance. Amen. You know, when you, it's funny. When they shut that jail door behind you, and you smell everyone's feet that have been there the last 20 years in that cell. <laughs> you start thinking about your future. And then it's nighttime and it's cold and it's just every you know, you think, man, I might just give God a chance. <laughs> Whatever situation he puts you in. Right? I literally got on my knees in there and prayed to God. First time ever in my life. On that dirty floor? On that dirty floor, man. <laughs> Down there on that bunk. In upper, in the corner. See, the, thank God I had the corner cell because it's a little bigger. Because I'm claustrophobic. And thank God I had a couple cool guards that would leave my thing open at night. Because I told them, look, man, I'm going to have a heart attack in here, man. I'm claustrophobic. And so they, they would leave that thing open. And at least I could sit at that door with my face in that, in that little thing and just breathe, man. Because if you're claustrophobic, you'll know what I'm talking about. If you're not, you think, yeah, I'm crazy. No, I'm claustrophobic, right? First time I ever went to jail. First time I ever went to jail in my life, I was in the holding tank. I'm in there with about 14, 14 men. The, the tank next to me is empty. All of a sudden, I'm in there for about an hour. All of a sudden, they take everybody out of the tank that I'm in, and they put everyone in the tank next door. And they bring me a pitcher of water. And that back in it, you could smoke in the jail. And they brought me a couple cigarettes and said, here you go. And I'm like, hey, what's going on, man? Bring those people. And everyone's looking at me. Hey, put those guys back in here. What are you doing? And everyone's looking at me like, what's up with this guy? Well, my sister had called and told him, I'm just giving you a heads up. My brother's claustrophobic. He's claustrophobic. And he's going to be responsible for himself in there. So I guess they had... Had people who nutted up and just freaked out on everybody. So they it was from that point on they were responsible to put me by myself and monitor me for a while and before they put me out there in the general population, which they ended up putting me out there in the in the general population. Because I was claustrophobic. So I got a little special treatment, amen. <laughs> but in, in that situation is when I you know I had decided in my heart probably before that, man, I think I need to try something different. But when you're in that situation, I think I might just give God a chance. So my first phone call, well, it wasn't called the bell box, but it was called Mike Johnson. Like, he didn't make me against my will. He won't make you against your will. I, I could chose to have gone back out there and done the same thing or gone to prison or whatever. It's my choice to make. It's your choice to make, right? He doesn't expect anything from us in return. It's love without, a, without an agenda. He loves us without an agenda. There is nothing you could do right now to make God love you any less than he loves you. There's no amount of sin in your life that's going to make him love you any less than he loves you. Amen. Right? 
He may not be pleased with your sin, but he's not going to love you any less. Therefore, there's nothing you can do to make him love you anymore. He loves you. Period, right? Love without an agenda. And that's how he calls us to love one another without an uh, agenda. His love is not based on what we have, what we do, or what we achieve. God's love is not determined by our behavior or our conduct. It's not dependent upon our background, our birth, our status in society. God's love is influenced by anything that we do. It's not influenced by anything that we do. It's unconditional love. He loves us because we're his creation. And he created us. He might not be happy with the things that we do at times, but he doesn't love you any less. Right? God says you are worthy of his love solely because he desires to love you. There's nothing you can do to win more of God's love. Nothing you can do. He loves you, right? All through his word, uh, it says God is love. And even as Jesus hung dying on that cross, he asked his father to forgive those who were, who were in the process of murdering him. I mean, what an example of love. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. When that guy takes your parking spot at Walmart, and he whips in there before you, you, you say, Father, forgive him for he know not what he did. I say something else. <laughs> I thank you, but I don't ever say that. We you say to him, hey, when we get that parking spot up front, we're like, thank you, Lord. Because we know it's from him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah. right. That's right. Yeah. Amen. God calls us to love everyone like he loves us. Amen. Period. There's no but after that. Period, right? We don't get to pick and choose who we love. I, I wish I could pick and choose who I love. That'd be so easy. Life would be so easy if I could just pick and choose who I wanted to love. But it ain't that way. It's not that way. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven. 37. Jesus replied, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And the second is love your neighbor as yourself. This is where it takes Christ to enter in and come do some transforming in our hearts and in our lives because most of us, up until Christ, don't even love ourselves. We find it hard to love the person that's looking back at us in the mirror in the morning as we Amen. wash our face and brush our teeth. Amen. But once you get Christ in you and you realize how valuable you are to him and that you're worthy and that you were worth dying for, then you start putting the value on yourself. You'll stop doing things to yourself that would hurt you and hurt your temple and punish you, right? And you start taking care of yourself. You start loving yourself. And if you have a relationship with God, the right relationship with God, we have no problem with his commandments. If I'm serving the Lord and love the Lord and appreciate what he's done for me and understand what he's done for me, then I'll love you. If that's what he requires me to do, I'll do it and I'll do it with the right heart. Right? Because I want to be obedient to him. John 15, 10 says, if you, if you keep my commands, you remain in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. You cannot remain in his love. You cannot walk in his love. You cannot be a vessel of his love if you don't keep his commands. We've been talking about it all, all year on, on, on Sunday. If you ain't obedient, man, and keep his commands, you're not going to operate in his love. He's not going to be in you. You're not going to be connected. You're not going to. He's not going to be abiding in there. You're not going to. You're not going to. You're not going. That love's not going to flow from you like it should, right? You can't remain in His love without keeping His command. When we remain in His love, we can be a vessel of His love to others. So I can't love you unless I abide in Christ. And, and, and let's get it clear. Anybody that knows anything knows that. There's going to be times because you love someone, you might have to get on them a little bit. Love is just not whipped cream and cherries, man. Right? Love is you love someone and you'll go to any degree to make sure that person's right. doesn't mean everything's going to be fine all the time. Right? Kobe knows I love him. Is everything fine all the time, Kobe? Negative. Negative. Why? Because I love him. Amen. So I'm just Amen. not going to allow him to do whatever and not say nothing. Amen. I'm not going to allow anybody in here. Amen. Because I love you. And that's why we've got a few empty chairs tonight, probably. And maybe why we have a few empty ones on Sunday, too. But oh, well. Amen. At least you know you're loved here. Amen. That's right. 
Oh, oh, I love you, but I'm not going to say anything because you're living like hell. And you're, you're, you're getting yourself in a train wreck, but I love you, and I'm just going to let you do that? Would I let my little grandbaby walk out in the road and get hit by a car? Yep. Because I love him. Amen. So why would I let a friend or a brother or sister in Christ <clears throat> set themselves up for a train wreck without at least saying, hey, ho hold on. Listen to me. Right? If I don't remain in his love, I'm going to love you the way Norman loves you. And that love is based on how you treat me. Because trust me, i got to love some people that don't treat me too well sometimes. i still got to love them. And I'm proud to say that I do love them. Right? I have to love them. Or, or that, that love would be on how I feel today. It won't be that agape love that comes from abiding in Christ. It won't be. Yeah, there might be times someone does something like, yeah, oh, I'm so done with it. I'll tell my wife, I'm so done with that. And then 20 minutes later, oh, man. And then I see them all, how you doing? You know how many times I've been done with Kobe? <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. You know how many times? But then I see them all, oh, man. I'm glad you're here, man. Thank you. Because I love them. Right? Because I love them. And I know God calls me to love them. It don't mean that emotions aren't going to stir up me at times so where I'm fed up and tired of it. I'm done with it. But then, man, that love that, that's in there from abiding, it, it, it can't stay in there. Amen. It overrides anything that Norman wants to do. It override, overrides the, those moments of anger. It overrides all that. It comes out. It comes out. It doesn't allow me to operate how I want to operate. It doesn't allow me to do what I want to do. It'll come out of me. It'll come out of me. My wife witnesses it. It's that agape love. Amen. It's from spending time with the Lord. All right? That's where it comes from. It comes from prayer and fasting and reading the word and praying and being in church and, and, and crying out to God for years. Lord, help me to love these people the way I'm supposed to love them. Help me to love you, Lord, the way I'm supposed to love you. All right? That's where it comes from. If you want it, you go get it. And if you don't want to love the way God's required you to love, then you won't. You've got to want to please him. It's about pleasing him. That, that's the only thing that matters. And in pleasing him, I'm required to do some things right here on this earth. Change the way I think and act and feel and everything else. And I'm willing to do it because I love God and I'm, I'm thankful for what he's done for me. Yeah. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to suck it up. I'm going to do what I got to do. To the best of my ability. That, that day I stand before him, he says, man, come in, good and faithful servant. I know you did your best, right? Not taking this grace for granted and just living however. Because we're in a period of grace and I'm saved. God forgives. That's not our best, right? God's word says we have a debt. We have a debt to love one another. Romans 13, 8 and 10. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt. Continuing debt to love one another. For whoever loves others has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet. And what other command there may be are summed up in one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is a fulfillment of the law. So let no debt remain outstanding except the continuing debt to love. So this is where we realize that it costs us something to serve God. We have a debt. We have an outstanding debt to God that remains as long as we are here on this earth and that is to show love to one another. To love your neighbor as yourself. That's our debt. We owe him. We owe him that. That we love one another. Who's your neighbor? Look around you. You're your neighbor. Go home. Go out in your yard. Look to the right. Look to the left. Look across the street. Those are your neighbors. And you're in line at Costco, Walmart, Bonds. Look around you. Those are your neighbors. Right? You might think, some of you are thinking, well, I don't know my neighbor. Right? I don't know who my neighbor is. Look at Leviticus 19.34. The stranger who dwells among you shall be as, as one born among you. 
And you shall love him as yourself. Stranger. For you were strangers in the land of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. So a stranger is your neighbor. So we just don't love those people that we know. Those people that we know their name. Those people who we know. We love a stranger. We offer hospitality even to a stranger. And the scripture says even uh, though you may even entertain an angel. Offering hospitality to a stranger. You know, there, there's a gentleman that's homeless. He's been homeless in this town for years. And I was leaving the gym the other day. And he was behind the dumpster there where he hangs out. And he was fighting the air. I mean, he was, he was having a fight with the devil, man, physically. It was cold. It was in the morning, probably 637. I don't know. And I rolled the window down. I said, hey, brother, what are you, what's up, man? He's cussing and screaming. And he's saying, so-and-so won't leave me alone. Someone from his childhood. And, I was like, and right then it broke my heart. I'm like, this grown man is being tormented from something that happened to him as a child. And he came over to my, my truck and he leaned in and he goes, my neck's hurting. They won't leave me alone. And I'm in pain. And he, he won't leave me alone. And, and I, I said, hey, brother, it's all right. Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. Jesus is with you. I just said that about five or six times. Jesus is with you. And he took a deep breath. He goes, thank you. And he walked back over to the wall of the dumpster and he was leaning in. But he calmed down. Because I just repeated the name, Jesus is with you. Right? I tried to love on him a little bit. That's all I could do for him was tell him, Jesus is with you, man. There, there's nothing there, bro. There's no one there. You're standing over there by yourself, but Jesus is with you. And he calmed down. He just, you could just see. He, he was fear. I mean, he literally thought there was someone there that he was fighting, and he wasn't. Right? That's, that, 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 that's showing love to somebody. That's just taking a moment of my day. As many people were driving by thinking, oh, this guy, man's lost his mind. I said it a while back, just a kind word. I didn't give him no money. Just a kind word in, in bringing up Jesus and, 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 and reminding him that Jesus is with him. Gave him peace at that moment. I felt the presence of the Lord come and give him peace, right? He wasn't a stranger, but same thing goes. There's many people out there that you don't know that, that are way worse off than you, right? And a word can do wonders. A word, just a word. Uh, uh, I shared it a while back with the lady there. Gave her a $20 bill to get some breakfast. And then I, I went back by and stopped and said, hey, the Lord wants you to know. And it was the word that brought her to tears. It wasn't the 20 bucks. No. It was the, taking the, the time to stop again and say, hey, look, man, people love you. God's with you. He wants you to know he loves you. And just hearing a word, right? A good example of, of who our neighbor is is, uh, in, is in Luke 10, the story of the Good Samaritan. Luke 10, 29 says, but he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who was my neighbor? In his reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. If you look at that passage of scripture, I've shared it with you church before, but that, that, that road, that way is called the bloody pass. And this happened quite a bit on that road. And it said they're going down, so it was a it was a downward journey of about two thousand feet, and it was where robbers would hang out and rob people because it's kind of out there. It's kind of like coming down the mountain on a trail from San Diego to Acatillo, right? And it said a priest happened to be going down the same road when he saw a man, and he passed on the other side. This guy see this man beaten. He's a priest, he's a man of God, and he's seen him and he crossed the street and went on the other side so he, he wouldn't have to come into contact with him. Right? And, I, and I've shared it before, I know none of us has ever done that. I know there's never been anyone sitting there hungry and you, you walked into a store and you just looked this way, that way you didn't make eye contact with him. <laughs> I know none of us has ever done that. That's what this priest did. Maybe there was someone walking on the sidewalk that you were walking on and they were acting a little weird and you said, man, you crossed the street. And he went down the other way. That's what this guy did. <coughs> so to a Levite, when he came to the place 
and saw the man pass by on the other side. And, and so there's a priest, the man of God, Levite. Uh, his role in the temple included singing psalms during temple services, maintaining temple grounds, right? They also served as teachers and judges. So this man was a man of God as well. Two men of God saw a beat man who was in need of some love and they crossed over to the other side because they didn't want to deal with it. But the Samaritan, 33, as he traveled, he came where the man was and when he saw him, he took pity on him. So the Samaritans were hated by the Jews yet he is the one who took pity on him. He didn't care about how a Jew felt about a Samaritan. He didn't care about that. He had the opportunity to show the love of God. Right? He had the opportunity. Remember what he said? If you keep my commands, you'll remain in my love. You'll remain. So this man wasn't going to let a Jew who had hated him keep him from remaining in God's love. Those other two didn't remain because they didn't show the love of God. They weren't walking in the love of God. That probably wasn't the first time that they walked by somebody in need and crossed over the other side. They hadn't been remaining because if they'd been remaining in the things of the Lord, even though they were men of God, they would have stopped and done something. 34. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his donkey and brought him to the inn and took care of him. Who have you allowed in your life to keep you from remaining in God's love? They didn't respond right, these other two, right? They weren't remaining. Who have you allowed in your life to keep you from remaining? Who has angered you to a point you would never help them? Who has you acting like the priest or the Levite? And he gets quiet in here when the old Holy Spirit spanks, right? Yeah. Verse 35. The next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said. And when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. See, he wasn't thinking about how he was treated by Jewish people. He wasn't going to see an opportunity to pay back evil for evil and just keep walking, right? He saw an opportunity to be the hands and to be the feet of Jesus. He understood who his neighbor was. Do you have a clear understanding tonight of who your neighbor is? I hope you do. Verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of the robbers? The expert of the law, the one who had mercy on him, Jesus told him, go and do likewise. And guess what, folks? We are to go and do likewise, too. Amen. I would ask you tonight, which one are you? The priest, the Levite, or the Good Samaritan? You might have had an opportunity today to display which one you were. I would bet, since we're talking about it, God will give you an opportunity before this week's over to display. Was it today? No, we get it. We get it. We pray for it every day, but we get it every day. Every day. Let somebody out to help somebody. Every day. Yeah. Because you, you, you're remaining in God's love, right? We try. Yeah. I mean, we, yeah. Do, we try to make money mind. every time, but yeah. it's, it's yeah. words and it's not money. Yeah. It's a hug. It's a. It's a, it's a they say yeah. no. Talk to them. Yeah. Tell them we love you. God yes. loves you. You don't hate. Yeah. Yeah, it don't have to be money. It don't have to be financial. Just, just taking the time to let someone know that they still exist on this earth and they're still seen. Many people I've talked to in those situations just appreciated me taking a moment and making eye contact with them. Because, they, because all day long people have walked by them like they're invisible. The priests and the Levite have even gone on the other side of the street. Look the other way. Like they don't exist. Taking a moment. Hey, how you doing? Looking them right in the eye. Giving them a moment of your time. 
Right? So we're commanded to show this kind of love. John 15, 12, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. See, we love one another, our neighbor, our friend, just like Jesus has loved us, just like it. Nothing more, nothing less. Just like he loves us, we're to love him. And we'll never love the way we're supposed to if we don't abide and remain. Remain in me, it says in John, and I in you, and you'll bear much fruit. First fruit of the Spirit is love. And that's not going to happen, right? It doesn't matter how long we've known someone. It doesn't matter that we might have heard something about them that we didn't like, right? We just follow this commandment in love. One another, a friend, a stranger, whoever. That's walking in obedience to the Lord. When we can just walk that scripture out in our life. No matter what I've heard about you, no matter what I heard you give to so-and-so, I'm going to love you. I'm going to help you. However I can. Right? How many times have you let what you heard about someone to, 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 to direct how you treated them? Well, I heard this about this guy who did something like this like six years ago. I, better, I, ain't, I ain't getting involved. I'm not, I'm not even talking to that guy. Well, God put him right in your path to show him a little love. And you just like say, no way. No way, Lord. Not this guy. Pre-projection. Yeah. Yeah, we judge people on what we hear. Uh, and therefore, we treat people. In the, you know, we did that out in the world. That's how we handle things when we're worldly. But that's not how God calls us to handle things. You just might be the person to bring this guy into a personal relationship with the Lord. You just might be the one that, that he might listen to. You'd be surprised at what an act of love will do in a person's life. Look what it's done in your life in your relationship with the Lord. That act of love has changed your eternity, your address for eternity. A mansion has been prepared for you. All right? It does a lot. We express our love for others by caring for the sick, right? Matthew 25, 35 through 36. I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. See, this scripture talks about specific needs. In that scripture, there's some specific needs that were fulfilled, right? And the world's not going to fulfill those needs in a person's life. The world's not. The world don't care. We're supposed to care, right? It's up to the body to do so. It's up to the body of Christ to do and meet those needs if we can. And 2539, when did we see you sick or in prison or go to visit you? The king will reply, truly I will tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. See, we've all been blessed by God, and he's telling us that there's a way we can bless him, and that's by fulfilling the need in someone else's life. We, we, we get a chance to do it once a month with, with outreach ministry, right? We get to go to slabs together as a church and fulfill those needs. And I, you, you, you all that's gone out there, I haven't been the last few times because I've been out of town or whatever, but I've been hearing reports that it's it's just growing and growing, man. It went from maybe 10 or so to those tables are full. we we got to get more tables and chairs, man, to meet the need out there. Why? Because some few people went and they said, and there's people that I met the last time I was out there, like two months ago, that have been out there for 12 years. And we've been out there going on two now. It's going on two years out there now, and it's the first time I've even seen these people. It's like, where have you guys been? Well, you know, I heard you guys, what you guys were doing, and I thought I'd come check it out. You know what? People see consistency. Consistency. You know how many people go out there with good intentions, and they do do something, and they say we'll be back, and they never go back? Because maybe something else comes along? We've been lucky and we've been consistent. There's other people doing it too, praise God. But every once a month, we're out there consistently. First Saturday of the month, man. They, they know. And now they got me in their little chat group on Facebook. I can post, hey, we'll see you guys Saturday. Be out there, have lunch, blah, blah, blah. Lourdes is in it too, right? Consistency. 1 John 3, 17. If anyone has, listen closely, all you people that have, if anyone has material possessions and sees a brother or sister in need, 
but has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? How can the love of God be in that person, right? How does the love of God abide in a person who knows there is a need yet, has no desire to fulfill that? You know how many people from other churches come to us with needs? Other churches, way more resources than us. Way more. And they'll come to us because they can't get their need fulfilled in their church. And what do we do to the best of our ability? We, I mean, we're, you'd be surprised at the needs that we fulfill. It blows me away. Because when you're filled with the love of God, you're not just going to try to help those within your little church, man. You're going to try to help whoever you can help. Because we're all the body of Christ. <laughs> love maintains fellowship, 1 Peter 4 8. Above all, love each other deeply, for love covers over a multitude of sins. Love, right? Such a love will publicize faults and failures of others, right? They'll protect them from public view, right? Covers a multitude of sin. You, you, someone does you wrong, you love them, you're a Christian, they're a Christian, they come and repent, and that, cover, that love covers that sin, man. God's love covers it. And then the, if you sin to one another, the scripture says you go and make it right, right? A love will cover a multitude of sin. True love will overlook faults and failures in others. True love, though, because you realize the faults and failures that God's overlooked in your life? Yeah. There ain't nobody I can't love. Yeah. Really? The, 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 I've been in the Lord 18 and a half years. Back, back in the day, uh, when I was in the home, I might not have felt that way. But now it's like, man, I, I can't. Whatever he was done to me, i got to love him because, man, look at the stuff the Lord's forgiven me for. Wasn't that way. Tim was in the home when we went that way back in the home, huh, Tim? I'll meet you out at the trash can after lunch. <laughs> we take out the trash, meet me out there. Do me dirty. <laughs> tell on me. Go to those leaders and tell on me. <laughs> I'd be like, hey, Joey wants to take out the trash with me tonight. Oh, no, I don't want to take out the trash. <laughs> That's the kind of love I had. Oh, right? Still operating in norms love. But man, once you abide for a while, <laughs> once you abide, you can't help but love. Right? You can't help but love. Love promotes service, right? First Thessalonians 2 8. So we're so we care for you because we love you so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. Our lives, right? So deep was Paul's concern for them. He was anxious to share with them rather than to receive from them. He wanted to share, he wanted to do something for them, right? Sacrificial service. Promoting the gospel because you love the Lord, right? Doing all you can to promote it. I just ask you tonight, if you would get graded on being a Christian on a on an A, B, C, or D, if you were graded by the Lord today, if you had to get your report card from God today, for being Yeah, F. Some of us might even get a G. <laughs> <laughs> You were graded today on being a Christian. If, it, if, if today was progress report day, what grade would you get? I got to beat the, my boss the mailbox. What, I want you to, you know, I want you to really think about it. If I was to get graded today by God, if I was to get graded today, man, today, hey, today's the day I get called into the office. I got to get graded, man, for my service to Him, my love to others. For, for doing the best I can do to walk this scripture out in my life. What would your grade be? We got more to cover, but I think you get the point. <laughs> right? I can leave it right there. We're called to love. Amen. We're called to love. And we're called to love the people that aren't easy to love. Yeah. And I tell you what, there was a time when I came to the Lord, I wasn't easy to love. But a guy named Mike Johnson loved on me anyways. Gave me a chance, man. They were even going to send me back to jail. And I didn't even know because I was so bad there. And they were just going to send me back. They were just going to take me back and bring me back to jail because they thought there, there's no way. This guy's not going to change. But they showed me a little love and a little grace. Amen. Amen. And that day came and uh, 
Mike came that morning. I didn't find out about this until months later. Uh, and he said, no, nah, we, we can't. We got to give him another chance. Right? And so I was on discipline. I was on moto. I had been on moto for a month. And they brought me to the office. They said, you know what? You're off discipline. And I'm like, well, shoot, I just got caught smoking cigarettes. I'm supposed to be on moto for a little bit longer. This is it. We're going to show you some grace. I want you to understand what grace is. We're going to give you a chance. You have dug your hole so deep already and in trouble that you can't get your way out of it. But we're going to show you some love. We're going to start from this moment on with a clean slate. Give us that moto badge. Clean slate from here on out. And if you don't get it worked out, it's on you. I think I got one write up after that in that home. They were showing me that love. You got it right. Was all I needed because I had given up on myself because I had dug that hole so deep that I knew that I, man, I can't. But they showed me some love. You know how many times I've done that for men in the home? Did it for me. Numerous times. I've extended that same grace and love that was shown to me with a dude that's knucklehead. I see these guys and it reminds me of who I used to be in that program, right? But I show them the stuff. I say, hey, I'll bring them in. Clean slate. Get a, get a do-over. Get your mulligan, man. I'm going to show you some love. It worked out for me. I think it, I think it was a good decision they did it for me. Amen. 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 Show some people some love. Amen. Honor God that way. We want to say goodnight to those online. Go ahead and close in prayer. Lord, we come to you tonight.